several verses and um, I'm not going to go right to the verse, but um, if you just look at the, uh, the title, I've titled our, our um, uh, thing is the stewardship of the basic gospel. We have a gospel stewardship. Um, we think about stewardship in a lot of different ways and we've been exploring that this, this, this uh, month. But one of the stewardship centers around that we've been given and trusted with the treasury of truth, the gospel itself. 500 years ago, this Tuesday, is the celebration of the 500th year of the Protestant Reformation. That Reformation changed the course of the entire world because that's what truth does. It changes lives and people's hearts. You know the story, I mean, of Luther especially, uh, was antagonized by a lot of different things. He was, he was a Catholic monk, he was an Augustinian monk, he was doing the Mass, and there was the uh, event that they call the Terror of the Mass because he could not feel like he was worthy enough because in the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, when they had the Mass, you were actually handling the body and blood of, you are actually handling Jesus Christ. And he felt that he was unholy and unworthy to do that and ran out. You have the Tower of the, the Terror Tower, you have uh, all sorts of things that he was doing. He was driving people insane because he would spend about three hours and at that time in confession driving other priests insane because every little thing he would try to confess because his soul was so vexed, so convicted, so, uh, I guess he felt so, uh, I guess, unho unworthy, so separated from God and in, in, in the light of God's anger with him, he did not know how to solve that. It, it, it stirred up things in his life. Of course, in 1517, uh, he nailed 95 questions on the door at Wittenberg for the church to deal with. He wasn't really thinking about leaving the church or doing anything, but all of a sudden, it, 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 it spread everywhere. And you know why? You know, they had social media in that day. Their social media was not Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. Their social media of that day was the, what it was called the printing press. It was brand new. And all of a sudden they could, they could disseminate information wide and far unlike they had never had been able to do before. There was another man by the name of William Tyndale. He was also a man who was a reformer who gave his life in the cause of that reformation that we hold fast to today, the gospel. And he, he translated the, the Greek and the Hebrew and the Latin into English. Now, that was a no-no back then. You were, you, he, was, he, was, he was put down. In fact, what the Church of England did when they found the copies coming into England, they would always scarf them up and destroy them so that the people couldn't read the Bible for themselves. In 15, that would happen in 1526. In 1530, he not only did the New two Testament, he translated the Old Testament. In, in Bel See, he was staying in Belgium. From there, he went to Belgium and, and was around there in Antwerp. And he was, he was trying to get the gospel as to many places he could in English. And as he was going out in English, he was meeting with all the, the businessmen of the day. And one of the businessmen actually betrayed him, so basically brought him out of his safe house. They were, he was arrested, put, in, put into the tower or the prison of that day, and was killed in 1535. Now, one of the things he said, and I'm, I'm going to read directly from a, from a quote here that he said uh, as he was ending his life. There were two things I wanted to read. One of the, one of the things he said was was he was in the dungeon he said I suffer extremely from cold in the head and so he wrote please give me a cap a coat and a patch to cover my legs but above all he said kindly permit me to have my Hebrew Bible my grammar and my Hebrew dictionary that may spend the rest of my time in study as he was dying, because his body was, uh, they, they killed him and then they burned him at the stake after he was dead to dispose of his body. But his dying prayer was this, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. We could say the same thing that for our leaders today, couldn't we? Yeah. Open 
open their eyes. See, the Reformation changed lives because of the power of the Word of God itself. One of his favorite verses, and this is the verse that we are kind of being our theme for today when they say gospel stewardship of Tyndale. One of his verses that I read in one of his uh, biographies that was written about him was this. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 20, he says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now listen, think about that. Your death is going to be your gain. So as a Christian, you don't fear death. If someone's going to take your life, let them take it. You know why? It is your gain. Because if you're going to give your life for something, you better give it for something that's going to last. Something that is meaningful. Something that has power. And what Tyndale, William Tyndale believed was that his whole life was about demonstrating, proclaiming Christ as his and everyone's Lord. And the reason he did that because he believed God initiated all of salvation. God was the great initiator. All the phases, all of salvation, and all of its parts. You see, we mismanage things. And sometimes we mismanage the truth of the gospel in our lives, in our witness, in the things that we do. We mismanage things like money. And we get into debt, don't we? We mismanage relationships. And we get into conflicts and we wreck marriages. We mismanage our work. And we, we work in places that really are not making us happy and serving the Lord in them. But sometimes churches mismanage the gospel. They mismanage the gospel and make the gospel more about self-help today than it is about a sinner being come right with God by the grace and marvelous mercy of him. You see, the gospel is not just self-help. It is, in fact, God help. Because we, of all people, are at a wit's end, you could say. We are in a place where we have no hope unless God, who's the creator of all things, is merciful to each one of us. None of you and me is worthy to stand before God by ourselves. None of us are that way. If you ask an average pastor today what it takes to have, and let me just uh, preface that, maybe an evangelical pastor or even a Southern Baptist pastor, what it takes to have eternal life, you would likely receive an answer highlighting the truth that forgiveness and the promise of a home in heaven can only come to us by God's grace alone through faith alone. There's a famous verse in the Bible that says just this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, the gospel is about not boasting. Not thinking you're smarter than people, not thinking you have more knowledge, more understanding, whatever it is. The pastor may go on to stress for the purpose of being ultra clear like I like to do. That there's nothing, not a, nothing in this old world that we can do to bring to our own salvation. We don't do it all. We don't do any of it. In fact, it is entirely the work and gift of God. Salvation starts with God. Salvation is of the Lord. And it is ends with being a gift of God all the way through. We can only receive it through faith in Christ alone. It is not dispensed by the church. It is not dispensed by uh, a, a, a famous preacher or anything like that. You do not store up grace. We do not have a treasury of grace that we can give out today. It is but given by God and God alone through his word alone through faith in Christ Jesus. So that is what we proclaim. That is what our church stands for. And that is what I'm willing to die for. And so I don't care what people would say on the outside. That is what we believe. Now, it has all sorts of ramifications. With a statement like that, uh, you get amens from people, right? 
people that believe in that, people that love that. But that was not the case 500 years ago when the Western Christianity was almost entirely dominated by the Roman Catholic Church whose theology and tradition and practice at that time promised something vastly different than a Protestant understanding or a Baptist understanding of salvation by grace alone through faith alone. On the contrary, the salvation offered by that Roman Catholic Church. Now, I believe that I'm a Catholic. I'm part of the worldwide church of God, aren't I? I am Catholic with a, maybe a little c, saying that, or, or whatever you want to say, that I believe that we are all one. I can look across the boundary and call my Presbyterian brother or my Bible-believing brother or my Bible church brother or non-denominational brother or interdenominational, as long as they believe in the gospel that has been entrusted to the church, entrusted to us, we call them brothers, right? And sisters. Because we're, there is a universal church and we are all part of that. But the Roman Catholic Church, back then, as of the 1500s, stressed that there was a necessity of works and even went so far to endorse the, a variety of monetary transactions that would, so they taught, would help a person gain favor with God for the purpose of securing their own salvation. And in some instances, the salvation of their dead loved ones as well. Among these were the purchasing of relics, items that were purported to have been consecrated and connected with Jesus or one of his apostles in some way. Many Roman Catholic parishioners were urged to buy relics as a way of displaying their desire to come close to Jesus and therefore honoring him and also incurring favor with him. In other words, it's almost like Greek mythology. You do something to curry favor with God. God does not dispense his favor because you are obedient or do anything to him. He does it out of his free and marvelous will of grace. He does it because he wants to. He does it because he has chosen to. You see, people were, were trying to buy relics because they thought that they could get closer to God or God would be more favorable to them if they had a relic in their home. That is not the case. People likewise were encouraged to go on pilgrimages. Pilgrimages that, uh, which served both as a source of revenue for the church as people uh, brought the souvenirs and supplies from the church-owned vendors. They would go on these things and they thought that they would, this would be pleasing God to the point that he would give them some favor in his eyes. A third and major practice that spawned the Reformation was the selling of church indulgences. These were certificates signed by the Pope that supposedly granted the purchaser or a dead loved one forgiveness of sins and subsequent release from purgatory or even hell itself. Now, these are bad enough. However, we mismanage things too, don't we? I mismanage things as well. I have to confess to the Lord then I need to grow in my stewardship. Not just of my life and my work and my relationships and my money and my service, but also the, the stewardship of the gospel itself. You see, God has initiated the relationship with us. In our salvation, we don't make the first phone call. Luther taught that uh, he thought he had to love God and become holy and to make the call and then God would save him. But he got it backwards. And when he found that righteousness comes by faith, it was an amazing thing for him. It freed him up. 1 Corinthians 4 verses 1 and 2 says that we are stewards of this gospel. And Paul writes, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ. And listen, stewards of the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God are found in the gospel. And then he says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they may be found, what? Faithful. We may not understand, in fact, no one understands God completely, doesn't we? We don't understand how he, 
He, he dispenses his grace. We don't understand why he chooses some and not others. We don't understand how God operates in this world completely, do we? We know a little bit about God. He's revealed to us in his word. And this word is sufficient for all that we need for life and for godliness. You see, the, the Bible is very important to us. We've been entrusted with sharing this gospel with the world. So first of all, we need to make sure that we have the gospel right, don't we? We have, we have to understand the gospel because the, the gospel is the message we take to the world. The gospel is, you take, is the message you take to the people you work with, your neighbors, your friends, your families. Because we believe that apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, people will die. People will spend eternity separated from God in hell. Being punished for the deeds that they have done in the body. The discussion of the gospel always is glorious. It focuses on Jesus. You know, anything that focuses on anything other than Jesus... The Holy Spirit, you know what the Holy Spirit does all the time in his ministry in our lives? He points us to Jesus. He's always pointing us to Jesus because Jesus is always, uh, always revealing the Father. And so that's what we need to understand that we, if we are Jesus people, we should be radically Jesus people. And the gospel is, should be most valued in our lives. And so today we're going to examine a few things that you can do to manage the gospel in your life. They're simple. You probably have heard them before, you know, and we don't, and it's the same for Billy Graham or John Piper or Tim Keller or, or anybody, Michael Horton, they're, they're the same things that they need to do to, to be stewards of the gospel so that the message doesn't get lost in our lives. Let's take a look at them. Number one, God wants you to take care of his gospel through a lifestyle of prayer. Through it. I say a lifestyle of prayer. I don't mean you pray a little bit here and there. But you're praying as a lifestyle. You're just doing it. Prayer is not difficult. You know, prayer is just simply talking to God. Saying, yo, God. Well, however you say. However you speak. If you're Texan, you say, howdy, God. If you're, if you're, if you're uh, you know, whatever dialect, whatever language. And this God has all eternity to listen to your prayer. Because he's a beyond time. He, he never gets tired. He never goes to sleep. He's, 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 this God is a God that lasts. He is, he is forever. He's eternal. He's beyond time. He created time. He lives outside of time. And when you pray to God, he doesn't have to go, quick, 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 quick. Come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. He can take all eternity because he's outside of time. In fact, our faith at the time we've surrendered to Christ can be expressed in a prayer. You know, when we, when we have faith, we, we tend to pray, don't we? When we you, can, you, can, you can put it, you, kind of a thermometer on this. When you pray, you probably have faith. When you don't pray, guess what? You probably don't have faith. And you can look at your life and, and see the thermometer of your faith that way. Now, let me just say this. That we're not saved by praying. You know, there, there's a common thing that if you say the sinner prayer, you'll be saved. No, that's not true. Sinner's prayer has never saved anybody. You know what saves people? Faith in Jesus Christ alone. And that can be expressed in a prayer. We lead people in prayer to pray for their salvation. Yes, we do. But it is the faith that is, saves us, not the prayer itself. You see, sinners usually don't pray unless they're converted, unless they're born again, unless they, they don't pray in faith. And so God, God grants us that and we pray that prayer and we remember that time when we prayed that prayer in faith. The Bible tells us about the habits of Jesus in prayer. It says in Mark chapter 1 verse 35 that Jesus prayed. It says, and raising, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went away to a desolate place and there prayed. In other words, you got to get away. You got to decide that you're going to pray not for five minutes or 10 minutes, but maybe 15 or 20 or 30 minutes. And I guarantee you that time will go by like that. It will. 
You'll find out, I don't even know what to pray for. I don't have enough things to pray for. Let me tell you, once you start praying, everything that you should be doing or had, needs to get done will come into your mind. You write it down and you start praying about it. God will just give you things to pray about that you have never heard of. The stories in the news you'll start praying about. You'll open up your Bible and pray the Bible back to God. That's one of the great ways you can pray to God is just pray God's word back to him. Luke chapter 5 verse 16 says this. But he, meaning Jesus, will withdraw to a desolate place and pray. Since we all believe in prayer, it's hard to imagine that any of us would go a day without praying. But I'm willing to guess that we've all done it one time or another. Um, see, we can't be entrusted with the gospel. We can't be stewards of the gospel unless we have a fundamental lifestyle of prayer for ourselves and for others and for the glory of God. See, sometimes prayer is praise. You know, we, we adore God. We sit in a room and we just adore God and say, God, you're great. In order to realize that the gospel of God, it's about who God is. And who God is, is that he is the creator of all that we see. He is beyond time and he is Lord over all. That is who the God we worship is, isn't it? And we're not, we're, I'm not asking you to worship a God who's, who's, who's like a man who, who, who forgets. He uh, goes, oh, I forgot to do that. I'm not asking you to worship a God who has, has just a little bit of power here and a little bit of power here. And so you have to offer sacrifices to him. I'm not asking you to worship a God that you have to appease yourself. That appeasement between us and God was carried out on the cross of Jesus Christ, wasn't it? And not only did he die in our place, he rose again from the dead to show that he is the powerful God. That's the God we pray to. That's the God we do pray to. There was a story of three farmers I read talking about prayer. The first said, I think the best way to pray for the church is with your head bowed. In the church with your head bowed. The second said, I think the best way to pray is under the open skies with your hands lifted up to heaven in praise. The third farmer says, well, the best praying I ever did was hanging upside down in a well. You see, the third farmer understood the key to pray is dependence, is depending on God. Number two, we're going to go through these a little bit here. God wants us to take care of his gospel, not only through prayer, but through a lifestyle of Bible reading. You're going to go, well, duh. I mean, I mean where else are you going to know? Did I say that right? Duh. Yeah. That's a Greek word, right? That has to be a Greek word. You, you, you're not going to have any salvation knowledge without the scriptures being read, are you? You can know about God, that there's a God. The reason why people all over this world who've never heard of Jesus, never had a Bible in their hand, are still, when they die, going to be condemned and judged by God uh, because of their sin is because they've, they've said no to the God that has been revealed to them in their conscience and in creation. They've known God. They've said no to God. They've said they just ignored God. And so we need to get the gospel word to them. See, the Bible says this in Psalm 37, 31. The law of his God, this was, this was uh, King David saying this. The law of his God, King David's God, is in his heart. His steps do not slip. When you have the law of God, the word of God in your heart, there's a connection between you and the holiness of God. The Bible says only the, what, the pure in heart will see God, right? And, and, and that, is, that is entailed with the holiness of God. That is entailed with, with knowing the word of God. They, they kind of come together. And so reading the Bible helps us remain dependent on God. And when you read the Bible, read it for you. Amen. Not about somebody else. Man, some people read the Bible and they go, man, my wife should read that one. Oh, my son should read that one. Or my mom should read that one. No, read it as addressed to you. God is speaking. He still speaks today in the pages of his word. It's where Luther found the, the idea of, of justification by faith, that he was justified, that he was declared righteous before God by faith and faith alone. If you feel condemned by God today, if you feel like 
you, you've broken, in a, every one of us has broken God's law, whether, whether it is, whether it is uh, lying or cheating or, or using profanity or having other gods or, or having idols in our life. We all have broken God's law. Now, some of us have profaned God. We've used God's name in vain, and that's just not cussing. That's not being serious when we call upon God to do something for us. It's treating God as common. That's what meaning profane is. There were, there were things that were holy that were, you weren't allowed to use for common use, and that's what God does. So while reading the scriptures, you need to humble yourself and engage your, your heart in the spiritual work to seeking God yourself. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says this, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in on it when? Day and night. Only, only on the weekend, right? No, day and night. So that you may be careful to do according to some of it, some that is written in it, all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success there is a connection between the holiness of God and Bible reading you want to be conformed to the image of Jesus you want to really feel that your sins are forgiven you want to you, you don't want to feel the guilt from your sins today that you are under the burden of guilt you need to read the Bible because in the Bible comes life the Bible says that Christ came to give life abundantly doesn't he if you want abundant life, do you want abundant life today? Then that's something that you need to do. You find it in the pages of Scripture. It's full of life. Number three, God wants you to take care of the gospel through a lifestyle, not only of prayer, not only of Bible reading, but biblical fellowship in a church. I don't even know that uh, there is no state in the, in the United States now that more than 49% uh, of the people actually go to church. In fact, the statistics say that there hasn't been one, one county in the United States that has grown in the number of Christians in the last 20 years. We're losing, the church is getting smaller in the United States. The true church is getting really smaller in the United States. And, it was, and it's going to take something to, to, to band us together. You know, sometimes when, when times are tough, what do we do? We band together more often, right? We band together, we, we support each other more when times are tough. So God wants us to have biblical fellowship in the church. You know, churches can be notorious for their squabbles, can't they? But you know what? Biblical fellowship is sweet. I said this morning, Mark echoed it just a while ago, that the greatest day of all my week is Sunday morning when the church gathers. When the people come and they're talking with each other and you can hear the gospel conversations going back and forth. You should be thinking about how you can talk about the gospel to people as you're fellowshipping with them. As you're, as you're having, uh, you know, as you're having conversations with them. You see, back when I first became a Christian, I thought I could do it without the church. I didn't join a church, I went to several churches. I'd go to church on Sunday morning because I liked the Bible study. I went to church on Sunday evening because it was charismatic. I could raise my hands, I could shout and declare glory to be to God and not be looked weird. I went to a, another church when I went back home where, I, where at that time I learned some things that, that I thought would be instant power, instant spirituality. I found that it wasn't true. But I, I kept going to different churches all the time and, and you know what was happening to me? I got really negative about the church. I looked at the church and I, I looked at the church and I was going, you know what? I don't like any of these people. They're all hypocrites. You know, it's the uh, same old thing. No, there, there's no perfect church out there. You're not going to find the perfect church. This is not the perfect church. There's only a perfect Savior and a perfect God. And there's imperfect people who are still sinners, who still fall short of God's glory and still need to understand that the gospel is just as valid to them today as it was when they first committed their lives. Now, sometimes we commit our lives to Jesus, but it wasn't genuine. It wasn't real. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't passionate. It wasn't uh, convicting. Jesus really wasn't Lord. If that's you today, you need to make a profession of faith. Because what happened, whatever happened in your life, it wasn't salvation. It was something else. See, I thought, I thought I had a lot to offer the church. I was brash. I was outspoken. I gave many people an opportunity to practice patience, forbearance, and forgiveness. We need to be together. 
See, Proverbs chapter 27, 17 says this. This is about fellowships. Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. There's another verse in Hebrews chapter uh, 10, verse 24 and 25 that says, And let us consider how to stir one another up in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, it is in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We gather together to fellowship. You fellowship all the time. You can't, and, and you can fellowship with people who aren't Christians for the purpose of, of sharing the gospel with them. You can do that. Finally, and lastly, as we go out into the world, as we think about the gospel and the stewardship of the gospel, God wants you to take care of the gospel through a lifestyle of showing the truth. When I say showing the truth, he wants you to take care, to manage, to steward the truth of the gospel by showing the truth to others. You know what? The greatest way you will ever, ever learn the gospel is, do, is by sharing it with somebody else. When you, don't know, when you don't know how to share it with somebody else, you probably really don't know it with your, within yourself. There was a guy that... Um, a friend of mine told me about he had an experience with. He was a, a good friend of his. and um, he, was a, he was a real, I guess, on, he, he considered himself on fire. And he looked down on every other Christian because they weren't on fire. He'd go into church, he'd look across there, man, you're dead. He thought everybody was dead in the church. So he, he said, eh, there really isn't any church in America anymore. I haven't found a church. And, you know, he, he lived in Texas and he says, I really haven't even found a church. One day he said to my friend, hey, I went and preached this weekend. My friend said, what did you preach? Where did you preach? In church? No, no, no. I went to the Heb, the H-E-B. Now, some of you know the H-E-B. Do you? H-E-B is a grocery store right in the middle of Texas. It's a, it's a, it's a grocery store. We love to go to the Heb. And he went to the Heb, this guy said, and he felt that God was calling him to preach in the grocery store. So he went in about 9 o'clock at night, stood up on one of the cash registers, said to, said to everybody, God so loved the world that he gave his only son and you don't care. He got down and said God was telling him to leave before the police came. <laughs> See, I think sometimes we think that witnessing is like that. We get in people's faces, we, we push them into something that is not like that. Sometimes we think uh, witnessing is about, or showing our faith is about, like selling used cars. It's, it's saying, okay, I have a deal for you, man. Come on, I have a deal for you. That's not the way you share the gospel. You know who's in charge of the results of the gospel? God is. Successful witnessing is simply taking the initiative to share Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results with God. I'll say it again. Successful witnessing is simply taking the initiative to share Christ in the power of the Spirit and to leave the results with God. The only way that you, are, you fail at witnessing is to fail to witness. I mean, you don't have to have it perfect. You all have a story, don't you? About what? If you don't have a story, you're, you, you need you, come see me. Okay? I have a story to tell you. It changed my life and it changes people's lives all the time. See, we, we share our life. See, we share our faith in three ways. Our life, our love, and our lips. Three L's, right? Life, love, lips. But let me tell you this. If you just share your faith with your life and your love, you know what I call that? Egotism. Because you're only witnessing about yourself. When people say, I'll witness by my life. You're only witnessing to yourself. What you have to do is be able to declare something about what God has done in your life. Let people know the reason why you are the way you are is because God has invaded your life. God has changed your life through Christ and his death upon the cross that made you one with God. 
See, if your neighbor, now, if your neighbor sees you kick the dog every day, grumble at your wife every day, that's not probably a good witness. And, it, and what we call those people are hypocrites when they start sharing the gospel, right? People say that. But what sharing the gospel is, is simply telling people what's happened in your life. And understanding what happened, what Christ did for you. See, um, in John chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, there's a man who was born blind. And, and the Pharisees, you know, they were the people that liked to have rigid laws and made people live up to their standards of works and everything. And they were upset with this Jesus guy, right? Because he was healing people and doing things that he shouldn't be doing, according to them. And they, they, they asked this man who was born blind, but now see, they asked him, you know, why, why, you know, what happened? And he said this, whether he's a sinner or not, because they accused Jesus of being a sinner or not, I do not know. The one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. I was lost and now I'm found. I was dead and now I'm alive. I was, I was under the ground and now I'm above the ground. I, I, have, I have no passion, now I have passion. I had no love, now I have love. God changed me. God has done that. Witnessing. And we think back to the Reformation, to the fundamentals of stewardship. Whether it be your money, whether it be your life, whether it be your work, whether it be your relationships, or whether it be your service. Whatever it is, whatever it is, we manage it for God. And we can give it all away. Because it's not ours anyway. Basketball and baseball, baseball teams. By the way, the Astros are in the World Series, right, still? They are. Okay, never mind. In baseball, you learn to what? Hit, field, throw, catch. And you do that over and over and over and over and over again. You learn the, the basics, the fundamentals. That, that if, if you were going to be a steward of the game of baseball, you would have to keep learning those over and over and over again. And what I'm telling you today, if you're going to be a steward of the gospel, you need to be a steward and care for the gospel by prayer, by Bible reading, by showing your faith. Um, there, there's, I could mention another one called worship. We had not even mentioned worship today, have we? But worship could be a way you take care of the gospel. There's so many more means of God's grace. But this is it. You need to make sure your relationship is right with God. And as we sing our song of invitation, if you, if you have any doubts about that or if you're struggling with it, or maybe you have placed your faith in Christ today or this week or this month and you need to declare it publicly, you need to be baptized, I invite you to come forward. We're going to sing a song of invitation and I want you to come forward. I want to call you publicly to profess faith in Jesus Christ. If you need a church home, you need biblical fellowship. You need to commit to a local church. The Bible talks about that all the time. And if that's the will of God for you, you feel God calling you to that, we're going to sing a song. You come as God leads. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you.